All right, we're going to be going over chapter eight. This is going to be fire alarms and uh, fire detection systems. And uh, this is another one of those big things that uh, fire inspectors have to deal with, whether it's uh, requiring a, a fire alarm for a building uh, whenever it meets the requirements, and then making sure that the fire alarm system is, is going to be adequate for the needs of the, the occupancy. But it's uh, it's very important that we're familiar with these systems so that uh, we're able to uh, to really work with and be ready to work with and guide uh, either contractor, architect, whoever, um, to make sure that it's meeting everything that's supposed to. All right, our our objectives is uh, we're going to describe the basic components and functions of a fire alarm system, uh, the basic types of fire alarm initiation devices and indicate where each type is most suitable, and uh, the fire inspector's role in inspection of fire detection systems. Um, and the skills is how to test a fire detection system. And uh, we'll, we'll go over um, and be able to look at some enunciator panels and stuff like that tomorrow. All right, now the fire alarm system is there to protect occupants um, and the structure. Now here's kind of the, the thing about that. Uh, smoke detectors and fire alarm systems from either residential all the way up to, to large commercial um, or one or two family dwelling all the way up to like a large hotel, multi-story uh, skyscraper. There's, there's going to be some differences in the system, but also... Um, it's there to alert, to let everybody out or to know so that they can get out. I mean, that's the basis that we tell or teach um, in fire prevention is that if somebody hears a fire alarm going off, that they need to, to quickly exit the building. Um, whether we're teaching kids in high school or, or adults, it's all, it's all the same. Uh, so that's our main thing. The fire alarm systems are there for us, is for life safety, uh, but also they're going to alert the local jurisdictions to make a quicker response um, with the fire department so that hopefully we can catch it in, in the uh, early stages and be able to, to extinguish it pretty easily. Now, for them to, to do their job, they have to be installed properly and they need to, to comply with the codes and standards for that jurisdiction. All right. Included in almost all new construction provided, and, and that's one of these things, it's uh, provided that it's required. And uh, the, the codes for each occupancy class um, will kind of lay out what, um, what occupancies just flat out require a uh, sprinkler system or what type of of operation that's taking place uh, if they require it and it's basically according to occupancy load and things like that. All right, the detection uh, system recognized fire, so it activates the fire alarm system and uh, any of the building functions. Um, we talked about like uh, smoke doors and dampeners and the HVAC systems and uh, shutting off HVAC si uh, fans so that they're not circulating and pushing smoke out. Um, and they can range from very simple to very complex. All right, the inspection of these uh, begins in the plan review stage. Uh, whenever a contra contractor submits plans for approval, um, you know we're going to look at everything. We're going to double check it, make sure that again it's suitable for the situation, size, and operation. Um, you or the plan reviewer confirm the proper type of the devices, the number of devices spacing in between heads, uh, adequate power sources, um, wiring. Um, you can, you'll get into how many uh, visual strobes, the decibels needed, the, all these different factors that play in. And it's all uh, has to be hunted down in, in the codes and, and kind of using good judgment with them. All right, a good set of plans uh, is going to include the scale drawing of an area that, and uh, like the type of wiring. And NFPA 72, that. Uh, that governs the fire alarm systems, they, they are very specific in uh, 
in the type of wiring and in different type of specifications. Um, also should be included the manufacturer spec sheets um, and that should be also included in the the file for the building so that uh, in the future if it needs to be referenced back to it's, it's there and available. Uh, any voltage drops and, and battery calculations if it if it um, you know your build your your systems are going to have a are typically going to have a battery backup and um, and we want to make sure that if if for whatever reason that loses power or loses uh, voltage that um, it, it's still needed for or still adequate for standby operation. All right, the uh, the basic components is going to be the alarm initiation device and the notification appliance. All right, your and uh, your control panel, it uh, it links the initiation device and the notification appliances together. All right, in the uh, control panel, we're going to uh, link activation device, you know, like we had said, to notification appliances, but also um, it can indicate the source of the alarm. It may give you um, on these large commercial systems you may or may not have been familiar with them if you have a lot of fire alarms in certain commercial properties uh, but they're typically all your different detector heads are numbered so in the system it, it'll tell you detection activated on uh, d24 and that'll give you what part of the building or what part of the plan or, or what um, area that that detection is being picked up. Um, it also is going to manage your primary and backup power supply. Uh, it can be set for other functions as well. It may be tied in with a um, with a monitored system uh, with like burglary alarms and stuff like that. But your fire alarm, um, because it's a life safety, um, even more so than like a burglary alarm or a panic alarm. Uh, it's it's also required to have its own type box uh, in the uh, the alarm um, the alarm room your control room and control panel and uh, that's all spec'd out also in NFPA 72. All right, um, the panels they they are very different. They vary greatly from manufacturer to application to you know all that um, and you know, they, they do a bunch of different functions um, and it notes here that you can use it to silence an alarm and, and that's something if once you find the panel you're able to go in and uh, hit a silence and um, that way it'll it'll stop the, the noise you may have continue to have a visual notification your strobe heads may be uh, flashing but uh, it makes it a little bit easier if you don't immediately see smoke or fire uh, in the building, and then uh, you know, it may be something. You know, it could be as just as simple as a, a burnout ballast in a um, fluorescent light fixture uh, that could, you know, have a little bit of smoke that's barely visible, but it's going to set off the alarm, and, um, and that way, you know, you can go and investigate, and find out what's going on. The uh, remote enunciator is. Um, it's like a secondary display panel. Uh, it enables the firefighters to know the type and location of the activated alarm um, as they enter the building. It's typically going to be closer to the front of the building or, or easily accessible where your, your main panel may be locked in a room. Uh, it could be for security reasons or, or just limited, limiting the access to it. Um, and it's, they're, they're very simple. Uh, there, they should be clearly listed as to what buttons do, and, and the fundamentally, all the operations are going to be very similar. So, uh, if you can silence and, and get the information off of one, you should be able to on a, on a quite many of them. Um, the uh, monitor, the uh, control panel can also monitor the condition of the system, and they'll also tell you if there's a fault. If one in a regular self check, it may find that one of the heads are faulty, or or you know part of the uh, the appliances in within the alarm system is not working properly. So 
it can um, let us know that. And uh, those are typically not going to be an alarm activation. Uh, that's typically if um, it'll have a panel alarm to uh, to notify the occupants of that building that you know there's something up and something needs to be maintenanced and repaired. But um, it's usually powered by a 110 uh, volt system plus the backup power. And you can see in the little picture to the right where there are some backup batteries that uh, is there to, as uh, in the event the power goes out, the alarm system will still be up and, and running. Uh, alarms may sound the entire building or in a particular area. And again, that's going to be according to the, the type and setup. Um, and, and that's going to be something on the, the plan staging or planning stage if you need a system that's going to activate the entire building or just a, a certain wing or area. Uh, and that's going to be determined with uh, you and the um, protection engineer that's kind of drawing up the, uh, the plans. All right, our residential smoke alarms. Um, and these, these are, are pretty common, little single station alarms. The, um, they're battery powered, a hardwired backup battery. And um, for those that are required in every bedroom, on every floor, every hallway, outside of bedrooms, um, it's just kind of the same old fire prevention information that, that we're, we're giving out to, to people. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure on, on these is that we educate people about them. Um, the old style, like nine volt fire alarms are, are really kind of going away, uh, being replaced with the self-contained battery units. That's good for 10 years. And um, one of the other things about it, and I don't, I don't know if it goes into that further on in the chapter, but um, you know, they're, they're only good for so long. Uh, after 10 years, they, uh, they get with uh, different dust and lint and sediments and stuff like that that settle in there that makes them ineffective. So just after 10 years, take them down, throw them in the garbage, and replace them with, uh, with newer ones. All right, the, uh, there's different types of fire detection systems. There's ionization smoke detectors, and it detects the visible products of combustion. Um, these are are going to have that little tiny little particles and smoke, um, and uh, each type has their co their pros and their cons. Uh, there's a lot of systems that are out there that actually combine both technologies, so all the bases are covered. But they tend to be very very sensitive, and uh, you know, sometimes they annoy people to the point where they want to deactivate them. So it's just kind of having, having that happy balance. Um, and then you have the photoelectric smoke detectors. They just take the larger visible smoke uh, particles. And um, you can see in this where it, you know, how it works with the light beam coming through and the photo cells picking it up. Um, you know, it's, it's important to know how they work, but you know, if it's a, a good rated alarm system, it's it's backed by a third party uh, testing group like Underwriters Laboratory, uh, then, then it's going to do its job. All right, we have our alarm initiation devices and um, your this is your, your manual pull boxes. And that's one that if somebody discovers a fire, they can go and activate that to let everybody know. Um, and you may have some systems that are not monitored by um, by smoke detectors, they're they're just a uh, an occupant alarm. So um, you know, and it may be the the main device for that that building and that system. And um, you know, by pulling that, you know, it alerts uh, or sets off the alarm. And um, again, they can be arranged in in many different ways, but um, the best ones are the ones kind of that you see to the side that has the little key switch or key so they can be easily reset. All right. Um, you have the uh, 
alarm uh, devices, the manual initiation device, single action pull stay, uh, station, pull down a lever, toggle, or handle to activate the alarm, and the double action pull station, you have to perform two steps to activate the alarm. And that's typically in, in kind of, you'll see those in different schools and areas where the the threat of somebody trying to mess with something or messing with the alarm just to um, for a practical joke or a prank or something like that um, is more likely. It just kind of makes it a little bit more difficult, uh, but that's having to know the system. And, and I would recommend if it's a double action pull station that it's an area where the, the employees can be trained on, on how to use it to make sure that it's being used properly. Then you have automatic initiation devices that function without human intervention, can transmit alarms uh, to the fire department on or off-site monitoring uh, facilities. And uh, that's something that, that's where you uh, you have these ADT and, and all Brinks and all these different monitoring companies that, uh, you know, they'll they'll receive a, a trouble signal through a phone line and, and they are, they're alerted to it. So in, in turn, they're going to contact the emergency dispatch office or uh, department phone and uh, activate a response to that area. All right, the uh, alarm initiation devices is uh, the smoke detectors that, that you'll typically see in these uh, the buildings with the, the fire alarm systems. And uh, it senses the pro presence of smoke. Of the, we talked about the a couple of different technologies that it uses to detect smoke. You also have the beam detector, and uh, it's a type of the photoelectric uh, uses that type of technology, and that's kind of for larger areas. Um, it, it does a, a lot better job of, of detecting um, where you have more air movement and things like that. All right, you also have uh, heat detectors used in areas of extreme temperature uh, change and include spot detectors. Uh, a fixed temperature heat detector uh, operates at a prefix temp, um, and then your rate of rise detector activates if the temperature, um, if it rises a certain amount in a certain amount of time, um, then it uh, you may use a bimetallic uh, strip and uh, to activate the system. And that, Having that bimetallic is, you know, one one form of the metal that means the two metal. So one may react differently or quicker to heat than the other, and then uh, it typically kind of rolls up and activates a system. But um, you know, a lot of times the determination on what type of initiation device is going to be based on the the fire protection engineer that's drawing up the fire alarm system for the particular building and application. And then uh, we have the automatic um, line detector um, that uses wire tubing strung across the ceiling. Flame detector, and it detects the electromagnetic light waves produced by flames. Um, gas detector, and uh, it's calibrated to, have to uh, detect presence of gas. An air sampling detector um, captures air samples and uh, products for, it can be set for a lot of different ways. It could be uh, different types of gases that may be released in an area according to, if it may be a plant that has some type of operation to where they, they are concerned about certain uh, hazardous chemicals, gases being released. Um, and uh, you can find them in duct detectors. And uh, those are also can be used in your air ducts for like your HVAC systems to where if it detects smoke in the system, uh, it can activate as well. Um, something about the gas detectors and the air sampling detectors that uh, everybody should, should be aware of is, you know, kind of the changing in code. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing in, a, in the newest edition of code sets is f especially for dormitories 
Um, and I, I would dare to say it, it's going to be pushed in, in your residential occupancies as well, like your hotels and, and such, is uh, carbon monoxide detectors. If there's any type of uh, gas operated system, whether it be a water heater, furnace, washer, dryer, whatever, um, if there is LP gas used on the property, then every room um, should have a, or, or hallways should have a carbon monoxide detector. And, um, you know, those are kind of getting pushed as just as important as fire alarms. Uh, I think Canada has already really pushed that initiative. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of it here in the States now. All right, we also have alarm initiation devices that are included on uh, like your uh, sprinkler risers. Uh, you can see that there, that little red box uh, there at the valve, it detects the flow of water. Um, a lot of those systems have kind of like this little um, little stick with a, like a little fan blade on it. And then if it starts turning, if it, if it detects the, the movement of water, then it, uh, it says that, hey, there's a sprinkler head that's activated. There's water flowing somewhere, and we need to uh, alert people about it. All right, your, uh, your notification devices, uh, you have your, your audible alarm. They're all set, uh, the standard, and, and it's in, F in NFPA 72. But your standard alert is the temporal three pattern, which is your th uh, three short uh, blast followed by a pause. Uh, everybody's seen a fire alarm going off, and um, you know that that's going to be the the industry standard, the really the code standard for alerting device. So if you hear that sound, no matter where you're at, you know it's a fire alarm, and what you need to do. The um, Another thing is a visual alerting device. It's a high intensity strobe light. Um, and I'm sure you've seen those as well. And those even in midday uh, are pretty bright flashing and uh, they get people's attention. Even those that are hard of hearing uh, will be able to see that and know that, hey, the fire alarm's going off, I need to get out. Um, another alarm function, activating or shutting down air handling systems, which we talked about that in the HVAC systems. Uh, closing open doors, uh, we talked about that in, in uh, egress. Unlocking doors, um, if it's a controlled area where they they have a, um, a controlled ad admitted system or, or policy or procedure in place, uh, either by a guard um, or, or whatever, it unlocks those doors and makes it accessible for people to, to escape. And then also uh, tied into the fire alarm for summoning elevators. And uh, some of y'all may have heard my story about that uh, with a new alarm system being included in a school for uh, invalid people to be able to get to a, a second floor or to a, a functioning floor of a an auditorium. And, uh, you know, having that uh, disconnected to uh, maintain the use of the elevator as a means of egress for uh, the invalid. All right, so we have the uh, zone systems where it's going gonna, it's gonna to show where it's at in the building and where the uh, alarm was activated. Uh, or a coded system may identify the zone throughout the building with uh, audio notification. So it may, it may tell you um, according to how it's set up uh, where at in, in the building or the plan or um, So it'll tell you where the, the alarm is going off at, and that way you can, for the fire department response, to be able to know to uh, go there and to uh, check out the situation. Um, it can also be good that if you know that the fire is in a certain area or a certain zone, uh, especially kind of like in an industrial plant setting, and you're trying to escape, you know don't go that way. <laughs> you know, um, And that's what I was talking about with the fluidity of, of a um, fire drill and fire escape plan. So, um, you know, of course, no matter where the fire's at, you know, people are prepared to be able to escape. And then uh, 
and the different categories is a non-coded alarm system where the control panel gives no information. Uh, you may see an older system that's set up like that, but um, I've seen some very old systems that uh, still have the uh, the head information. And then, um, then you have some that may tell you just the area where the device is activated and not a specific area, just kind of a general area. His own coded alarm system um, is activated over the announcement system and the master coded alarm system is audible notification device used for other purposes. Um, and you may see in some newer buildings where you will hear the the three blast alarm that's notifying everybody that it's a fire alarm to get out but you almost also may hear some of your um, your alarms that'll come across over a loudspeaker uh, that has kind of a computerized voice that will give you directions you know proceed to the nearest exit uh, this is a fire alarm um, please exit safely you know well however they have it set up whatever message that they want um, you know, the, it'll it'll alert and, and notify the the public about what they need to do you sometimes you have those people who in the time of an emergency they just kind of just get frazzled and don't know what to do and uh, that kind of helps people like that to remind them that hey you know you need to get out all right how the fire department is going to be notified is a telephone to the fire department or the communication system or sitter um, And uh, you may have a system in direct connection to the fire department, um, and that may also be according to the system. I, I know there's uh, different plants that, uh, production plants, that they have their own fire department on facility, and and that may be something where the system goes directly to the fire department and, and alerts them. Um, it may have. Uh, where it alerts somebody at a, at a remote location it could be like a guard at a um, like a monitoring system or center where they monitor video cameras or whatever other systems and then um, you may have some that are transmitted um, by other means uh, the signals are typically going to be transmitted by the phone lines or a radio signal uh, just according to the setup. <clears throat> uh, you have the um, fire alarm system classifications as a protected premises fire alarm system where it does not notify the fire department. All it does is it tells people, hey, there's a fire in here, get out. And then you have a remote supervising station system where it sends a signal to the fire department, or I would rather the sentence say, sends a signal to alert the fire department or other monitoring location. Um, you know, we've had, whenever I worked uh, in different departments, you know, you'd have these alarm companies that would call the station and, and that number, you know, it's just by a blue moon chance that you answered that phone um, and have to tell them, and, hey, you need to contact our dispatch center and not our station, uh, that this is a non-emergency station number and you know, so on and so forth. Sometimes they get lazy and they just Google your number and think it's an emergency number. All right. The, uh, you also have the auxiliary system, building um, alarm trips, a master box, the proprietary supervising system where the alarms are connected to monitoring site operated by the building's owner. Um, I think we kind of covered that in, in different examples earlier. And then a central station is third-party off-site monitoring facility, and uh, that's going to be like your Brinks, your ADT, um, uh, all these different companies that uh, people pay for fire uh, fire alarm or, or uh, burglary systems. All right, we do have some wiring concerns because it is a part of it's a, an electrical device. Um, the correct wiring begins at one device and goes to the next until the last device is connected. So it's all kind of chained together. P 
People unfamiliar with wiring may add devices by T-tapping. Um, and if you do that, it'll function on site, but it won't be able to be supervised. Um, and that's that's something that, as you do an inspection, um, I encourage you to, to look at the wiring, make sure that they're using the proper gauge wiring um, according to um, you know, the manufacturer spec and uh, NFPA 72. And, uh, and you can look at it and, and see examples of uh, where it's improperly installed. All right. We've talked about how important they are. They, they've got to work properly and uh, they have to be maintained. Um, they should have a monthly visual inspection, and that's typically done by the, the building owner or the business that occupies that building. And then a yearly system test. Uh, you have systems that are that are tagged um, a lot like um, fire extinguishers and, and uh, your sprinkler systems and stuff like that. Um, and it just shows that, the, that they come out and check everything. Um, and the battery should be replaced every four years, whether they are low or not. That just kind of ensures its its readiness and, and its ability to operate properly and seamlessly. All right. Um, we as, as fire inspectors, especially municipal fire inspectors, we don't conduct the test on the detection systems other than the initial acceptance test. Um, we're typically going to have the the company that installed it, the technician there, and he's going to, you know, we'll make sure that it activates whenever there's flowing. Um, typically, we do that in conjunction with a sprinkler system uh, test um, to make sure that it operates whenever water's flowing and then um, different system activations. Uh, they need to uh, inspect the system yearly, and those, uh, you know, we can look at the paperwork from. That in uh, that inspection and see if there's any issues that was addressed then and make sure that they've been corrected and uh, kind of following that paper trail. All right, during the uh, the installation test, the two alarm technicians should be present. One in the field testing the device, one reporting what the control panel says or displays, and that's kind of in your your larger spread out system. Typically, you know, you'll you'll be able to be at the panel and, and see whenever one's activating for a test. And uh, an alarm company should perform an inspection before you arrive. They should, big word should. Um, a lot of times, you know, they're seeing what they can kind of get away with. And, and some sometimes, I mean, most of your most of your companies are legitimate and they're there to do a good job. But you may have one or two that's you know, they're trying to get away, see what they can get away with here or there. But uh, just be aware of all that. Um, but they should inspect it before you arrive and then you witness it. Um, that, that keeps them from wasting your time and, and theirs. Um, during the installation test, we want to activate every component, the trouble alarm, visual devices, um, the making sure it has proper signals. Uh, lockout circuit breaker to prevent accidental shutdown. Um, love your fire alarm pan, uh, power. And, um, you know, whenever it's tied into the system, what it's saying there is uh, making sure that that people just can't access the panel and cut off power to deactivate the system. Um, and that's kind of a safety issue. If somebody... You know, unfortunately, we kind of have a world with, with uh, bad people that wants to do bad things. And uh, this is kind of one of the concerns that we need to be aware of, that um, that the power source to the system is ready to go. Because the thing about it, those batteries aren't, aren't going to last long. And they, they should give a, um, a trouble alarm uh, to let them know it's on battery backup. Uh, at the annunciator panel, but if it's during a, a time where uh, maybe in the middle of the night or something where there's nobody there or it's not a monitored system, 
then uh, may be able to turn off the power and, and uh, drain the batteries and all that. So we want to make sure that that stays secure. Uh, you don't need to be physically involved with the annual inspection uh, process. Again, you just note for the tagging uh, whenever they, they inspect and tag the device. Um, and they should send results to you, the alarm company and the owner. Um, should, I've never had an alarm company that inspected anything in my jurisdiction send me anything. Um, it's typically whenever we go and do the inspection that you see that it's tagged, uh, just like a um, sprinkler system or a, a fire extinguisher. And uh, it's a good idea to keep the paperwork in, uh, in occupancy file and on site. Um, if you, you double up that information, it, you know, somebody's going to have it. All right, to summarize, fire alarm systems and fire detection systems are very important, and they're going to protect the occupants and, and the structure by providing early warning. Um, you know, these, these are very, very important because the, big, the best thing that we can do for occupants if a fire starts is for them to get out. And, uh, you know, we know that as firefighters, but um, we know this is a very important tool uh, to keep people safe. So you want to make sure that they're they're installed properly, they're designed properly, and that they're maintained properly so they can do their job. Um, we know that they, they recognize the signs of fire and smoke. Uh, they alert everybody um, that uh, we know we need to make sure that from the beginning that it's designed and implemented properly. Um, we know the parts of the alarm system, things that we discussed. Um, We know how the control panel links uh, the parts of the system together so it'll operate properly. Um, we know about the ionization detectors and photoelectric in the... Um, we understand the alarm initiation devices and uh, how that they're either manually or automatically initiated to, uh, to uh, get that reaction or the... Uh, notification of the fire department to have a response. Um, know that it, it also has audible devices such as bells, horns, or speakers, and um, they can control different the, the uh, building functions like the air handling system, fire doors, elevators, and stuff like that. Um, we need to be you know, somewhat familiar with the systems, if, especially in, in the larger buildings in our jurisdictions. And, um, and then kind of understand how they're, they're going to notify us if the alarm goes off. Uh, we need to make sure that it's installed properly and uh, so that it's going to work properly. And then, uh, you know, it's a third party inspection. On the annual inspection, we just need to make sure that it's been done and that any uh, any deficiencies that are cited gets corrected. All right, any uh, any questions on fire alarms? Any questions at all? I got one real quick. Sure. You said you said uh, <clears throat> that um, basically the system will be designed by the engineers in the planning phase, correct? Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this. I know just this is just purely informational because I know it, it's not going to be anything we enforce or whatever. We just basically going to inspect whatever system they have. What are the deciding factors as the type of system that they have? What guidelines do they use to determine, okay, it needs this system? All right. Um, NFPA, IFC uh, is going to, um, if there's any specifics according to the type of occupancy, it's going to lay that out. Um, okay. Now, as it gets more particular, that's really going to be based on the the code official um 
and that's where you you know the response of of the department and you know the policies and procedures and operation uh you you know what it's being used for and you you take all these different variables the, all the different factors and you put it in and, and you say okay they'll they may propose um having uh, your your detection heads in every certain space or they may just say oh we'll just in the middle of, of a room or um in in it to exclude closets and so that that's where you kind of say no that needs to be here here and here it needs to cover these areas um and and for the the different reasons um you typically it's going to be whenever you see a a, a fire alarm it, it's going to be to protect people while they're sleeping all right so say in your um or where it really matters, I, I guess the most of what I'm trying to say is like in your your residential occupancies, your uh, dorm lodging stuff like that, to where people can kind of rest knowing that it, if an emergency is going on, they're going to be notified of it, so they can get out of there, they can get their family out of there, and all that. Um, you're also going to see it on other commercial um, type buildings where you're kind of mass have a large amount of people so that that quick um, alert is going to uh, allow for that um, the egress of all the all the people so it's going to give you the more time um, the thing about kind of your specifics on it is you you reference the nfpa 72 you reference the ifc what it what it says in there and you, you use your good experience and judgment to be able to uh, kind of say, okay, yes, you know, this will work, or I want to see this here. Um, in certain modifications on it, um, whenever our school district, our local school district, added in um, just complete fire alarm system, now, and it's it's just a, um, a a system there at the school that's not monitored. They don't have any um, or very few detector heads, um, but I was able to go in there and work with them saying, okay, um, because of the age and old wiring and old features of this building, I mean, you're looking at, at school buildings well over 100 years old, um, I want a monitoring system in these areas specifically to let everybody know uh, so that we can evacuate these kids. And um, you know, we have a, an area that was part of a, an air handling area um, that had a lot of electrical components. Now by the code, we normally wouldn't have to have a smoke detector head in there, but because of the higher risk of the age of the building, the type of construction of the building, the the age of the electrical components it was more important to have that in there um and that's something where i can say yeah this is what we need and of course it's you know you may get a little bit of of pushback uh especially from whatever entity that's footing the bill um but you know you're you're being the the code official you're you're able to make those determinations with proper justification and um you know that's that's going to be another means to be able to tell you how that a system needs to be put in and and if you agree with if that's going to provide the adequate coverage right i mainly ask because i don't know how it is over in, in the county where you're at but in saint tammany parish the fire departments have absolutely no input whatsoever when these establishments are built remodeled or whatever basically we just get word about hey this place is going up or we see it going up and then we learn what it is so um usually nine times out of ten everything's already okay through the parish so we actually have no say so or anything um up until recently just a day or two ago um actually the new parish president which he's been in for a little while now but one of the things he's instituting is uh basically a public input um they're going to do sessions once a month or whatever um 
and that's going to be part of it is the fire chiefs going down and and pushing you know not just not just from the fire safety point of it but also you know how these establishments affect our ratings and all that non stuff nonsense so they they i know a big push is going to be um the codes part of it um because we all know St. Tammany's not the most straight parish in the world and if you got enough money you can do whatever you want but there's going to have to be some pushback from the fire departments to hold that accountability when they're building these places so that's why I'm asking and you know and that's kind of the touchy situation in in being um in the car of the fire code official and and that's the thing according to the way things are set up and and that's kind of like in my county um, with the exception of the two municipalities, the fire department, they're contracted. Um, we have two municipalities, Picking and Poplarville, that they're their own, they are their own entities. They do as they see fit. And uh, in the county area, the fire departments have no input at all on fire prevention, inspections, and things like that, because that's not part of their contractual, contractual agreement. Um, their agreement is to provide emergency response for um, fire rescue, EMS, and all that. Whereas the the county has a, a an official now. Um, I am the fire code official for Perver County, and I make all the decisions uh, as it goes from that. And I'm just kind of you know, showing the, the similarities on it. Um, but that, that I would think that you know, that they would have to have a a fire code official for the the entire county that would be having that type of mindset and and being mindful of of um, different codes and regulations and how it affects like what you're you're saying uh, fire code rating I mean not fire code uh, fire uh, insurance ratings and things like that um, but uh, but that's also where you know there should be you know even though the fire departments don't don't have a kind of a dog in the fight per se uh, they should have some input and in, and in, uh, in that's something where the fire code official you know should be given reports as to what changes are, are happening and, and things that are coming up in um, in the the different jurisdictions um, whenever I have a new construction coming up and there's um, some fire department features or fire protection features like a sprinkler system or something being retrofitted in or, um, you know, I try to uh, train or, or, or let the departments know so that they can train and kind of get together a response, uh, an idea for response or a um, pre-fire plan or guideline or book or something to where, you know, they're, they're aware of what's in their district. Um, but yeah, you know that's maybe that's something that'll hopefully it'll change and um, kind of get a little better response on it. That's um, the 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 rating bureau I know for Mississippi, and I'm I'm sure it's probably very similar to to uh, Louisiana, being that we're both on ISO. Um, they're very heavy on fire prevention and and things like that. So hopefully it'll help you out. Yeah, well, we also, aside from ISO, we also have PIL, which is, uh, in my opinion, which this is just my opinion, but basically it's a criminal organization because it, it's all ran by the insurance companies, you know, so who better than the greatest is the people that our job affects, you know, but. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Mississippi was a lot like that in, in the effect that it, we had a, a state rating bureau that was part of the division of, of insurance or the Bureau of Insurance, something like that. Uh, anyway, long story short is you could buy whatever rating that you're willing to spend money on. And, uh, you know, all it takes is money kind of thing where um, we're more on the performance base now. But in any which way, uh, any other questions on uh, fire alarms? All good here. All right. Well, we're going to roll on into uh, chapter nine.
All right, so our sprinkler systems, and uh, we'll talk about water systems, fire flow for required occupancies and buildings and all that good stuff. This is, if your head's not hurting now, it, it might by the, the end of this chapter. So uh, just bear with me. And um, a lot of good information here. Um, and this kind of, um, it's things that we already know as as firefighters, and it's good to have an inspector that has had time in as a firefighter that understands the concept of fire uh, fire suppression and how the, these devices kind of play in and how they give the benefit where the alarms give us more time for life safety and the the uh, the fire suppression systems actually try to uh, keep the fires small to buy more time. Uh, you can actually see in the code sets where if you have an alarm system and a fire our sprinkler system, then your factors are changed because you're making that building inherently a little bit more safer and it's a little better protected from fire so that you can have more people, you can have um, less joint stringent requirements um, because of these devices being in place. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see that and, uh, you know, whenever we kind of get in our skill stuff and we start get cracking into the um, code books we can see that you know where it all plays in and, and the different graphs and tables where we, we get our information to uh, to factor up occupancy loads and so on and so forth <clears throat> all right we're going to talk about the elements of a plan review for a suppression system uh, describe the two types of water distribution systems and uh, sources of uh, water from municipal or municipal water supply systems, uh, the major features of distribution systems, uh, describe the difference between dry barrel and wet barrel hydrants, uh, talking about static residual and uh, flow pressure, uh, describe the hydrant testing procedure, and uh, the factors to be considered during the design phase of a sprinkler system, and then uh, four types of sprinkler systems types of sprinkler heads, uh, the types of stand pipes, and how to test the readiness um, of a fire suppression system. And this last part, how to test the readiness, is actually one of the skills that uh, could be drawn for the level two. No, it's a level one skill. Uh, but anyway, so uh, so everybody kind of keeps some, some eyes and ears on that one. And uh, again, this is kind of the layout of the different skills objectives is uh, determine the fire flow, uh, perform an underground flush test on a fire suppression system, and um, hydrostatic testing on, on a uh, fire suppression system, air test, <clears throat> and a main drain test. All right. Mm, I don't know about all the, the bottom. We may. Uh, I have to look again. I think a level two skill is to determine fire flow. Uh, the rest of it, I think we're just going to talk about. All right. So the uh, suppression systems are going to be sprinkler systems, stand pipes, or any type of specialized extinguishing systems. And uh, you, <laughs> um, it says you may need to consult NFPA codes when working with fire suppression systems. Let's scratch out may and say you will need to consult. NFPA codes. Um, this uh, the the kind of the way these are wrote up cracks me up sometimes, but uh, but yeah, you, you're these are all every every nut and bolt in these systems are going to be uh, guided by NFPA. Uh, this is something else that's going to be kind of engineered by your uh, fire protection engineers, and um, they're going to produce a set of plans that's going to talk about all the different all the different variables um, you're going to have to to get a um, an assessment testing hydrants in the water system in the area um, and all these different things all the different information is going to be factored together um, to be able to give you the size and, and the way that the sprinkler system needs to operate and um, you know basically what we're doing in, in like a pre-plan is we're checking numbers we're making sure that everything looks right um, whenever we're approving a system like that. 
All right, so your licensed sprinkler system or our, uh, contractor is going to submit the, uh, the construction data or the building data. It's going to be your your uh, flow and your pressure in your water system, and then uh, the system design criteria for what they're trying to to do um, for that type of building and with the type of occupancy for that building. All right, uh, we're going to ensure the the appropriate sprinkler coverage. The, the appropriate sprinkler heads, the size and length of pipe, the water supply, uh, make sure that, that the data that they've received is current. And once they're reviewed, the, uh, the contractor should be contacted to let them know that you looked over it and uh, what either that you've approved it or denied it and so on and so forth. All right, so your water supply. Um, and, and I want you to kind of equate this and, and a good way to, if it gets gets a little bit um, confusing, kind of down the road, and as we're talking about some different things in this chapter, kind of equate it to fire ground operations. All right, if we have any engineers that are out there or driver operators, uh, whatever you call them, um, you know, it's 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 all the same fundamentally. So your water supply is going to be. Uh, it's got to be dependable and it's got to be adequate, uh, adequate for your fire suppression system. Same thing for your water supply for your trucks. Whenever you're you're pumping uh, on a structure fire, that it's going to support the operation that you you have planned. I mean, is it just you're just pulling a, a couple hand lines, or are you running two and a halfs and a deck gun? You may have a, a, a ladder raised. Um, so again, kind of equating that to in the similarities. You know this this might be uh, you know, very similar. All right, so we have the uh, two types of system systems. It's going to be either a public water system uh, or supply or a private water supply. Um, so your municipal water system is going to be a a form of a kind of of public and private. <laughs> And I say that in that uh, it's owned by your municipalities, but uh, if you don't pay for it, they cut you off, right? So, uh, but uh, the municipal water system provides water through the, the fire hydrants and the, the static water sources. Um, and you may have some areas um, where you have access to water, the static water sources. Um, certain canals, rivers, lakes, ponds. Um, we have a few in our county. Um, in, in the rural areas where fire hydrants are a little bit more scarce, uh, our cities are pretty pretty well covered in, in hydrants. And um, But uh, you know, we, we know about our, our different water sources for the system. Um, but the main thing is, according to where you're at in the country, is uh, they need to be able to meet the demands. And yeah, that's something uh, kind of a little bit of tidbit here while we're talking about water supply is a department I worked for um, did not maintain infrastructure like they should. And they, it was to a point where the, the water system, the pipe systems and, and all that was in such a bad shape that our state Department of Health actually uh, had a moratorium on any water taps. So that meant that there was no new construction in the city, and you know, new construction, new buildings means more taxes. So it pretty much was was kind of a, a spiral that luckily the city uh, ended up being able to make the repairs to the system and have the moratorium lifted. Um, but it is really important. You know, you you get water systems that don't. <clears throat> adequately meet the demands and, and drops the uh, the pressure down and it makes it unsafe for the occupants for the the safe potable drinking water um, and then the um, you, you're not having adequate fire flow to be able to to fight fires even your your even a trailer fire you know so these are, are things to be aware of you may have part of your districts where you may have to have tanker support or something um, that's something where you kind of take in consideration that if you're familiar with the operations of that area, you can pretty much bet that your your fire flow in that area um, is not going to be adequate for 
uh, a real major system. All right, uh, and part of that is your water treatment facility. It's going to remove the, the impurities from the water, uh, can put it out as a static water source, um, and it may be pulled back in the system and filtered uh, if need be. Um, the most used co the uh, combination of direct pumping and gravity, uh, where they, they pump it either out of a source, typically around here is going to be out of the ground um, in whatever well source. Uh, it's going to be clean, filtered, and put up into a storage tank where uh, then it feeds the water system. Uh, it delivers the water through underground water mains, and the, uh, gen the pressure generally uh, is going to range from 20 to 80 psi. Uh, according to your areas, um, you may see in kind of some areas, you know, we're kind of really flat around the areas where we're at um, topographically. Um, but if you go to, to some of the areas where they're real hilly, have different or, or different elevations where they can put um, your, uh, they put their, their towers up on a, a higher area and they're able to pump, pump up the water to them that increases the water system uh, very uh, uh, the pressure on the water system pretty high and I've, I've actually talked to different firefighters and that work in areas like that where you know they can pretty much operate a, a structure fire with very little um, pressuring from their trucks um, and that's you know, several blue top hydrants and stuff like that uh, that would be a dream for, for most people. All right, and here's a, an example of the municipal water system distribution system being the gravity feed. Um, and you see the top picture where it pulls from a lake, um, where the, the water is, is purified, is treated, and then it's pumped down into cities in a valley, um, and where the gravity kind of allows the pressure for the, the operation of the water system. And then we have the elevator uh, water storage towers. That's pretty much what we're going to see around here. Um, and they, they maintain the pressure, even if the if pumps are not working to uh, supply the water. And, um, you know, they're designed to uh, maintain the pressure for a certain area. <clears throat> All right, mains come in different sizes. You have primary feeders, secondary feeders, and distributors. And they're typically grouped into the size, the in, inside diameter of the pipes. Um, the mains should, for most efficiency, uh, follow a grid pattern, but they may not always. Um, again, a uh, town that I worked for, very old town. Um, you've got water lines laid on top of water lines, and you may have a, uh, an eight-inch water main that crosses an old four-inch water main. Um, Parts of the, the system uh, from the distributor lines, you have the shutoff valves that's going to control the flow to individual customers uh, or fire hydrants. Um, and those, you know, those are a very important part of the system that needs to be exercised every year as, as part of the fire hydrant testing and water system testing phase because you may find valves shut off to a certain area that greatly affect the amount of, of flow water flow into a certain area of, of your jurisdiction. So just something to be, a, be aware of there. All right. <clears throat> you have the, the type of hydrants. as the wet barrel hydrants. I'll tell you what, before we get into that, uh, something I was wanting to, uh, to talk about on the, well, never mind, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and uh, I'll, I'll catch it. A little bit further down. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here. All right. So the the wet barrel uh, hydrants uh, using locations where the temperatures don't uh, don't drop below freezing, um, and they always have water in the barrel. Uh, we see those a lot out west. And the way that I kind of describe these is they they have constant pressure on them. Uh, and all those the knobs up top and your your like your steamer cap and then your your two and a half cap. Um, that's just valves. And they have the separate valves to control each outlet. Um, all right, we have the dry barrel systems here. Uh, that's typically what you're going to find out in our area. Uh, you may have some wet in some some of the older areas uh, regionally to where we live, but um, 
They're uh, used in in, in locations where temperatures drop below freezing, um, in uh, where they remain dry when not in use. Uh, they have only one large valve, and that's there at the bottom. Uh, you can see that um, kind of that uh, split view. Uh, you see with the the shaft that goes down the middle, that little coupling in the middle is kind of a breakaway. That if a car hits it, you know that breaks away the little shaft in half and uh, keeps the water from spraying out. And then you have your valve at the bottom that actually pushes down into the water main and allows water to, to uh, come up around its, its seal and to uh, fill up the hydrant body and then out the, uh, the steamer cap for the two and a half inch connectors. <coughs> Excuse me. Fire, depart or fire hydrant locations uh, is going to be a um, can be located according to your local standards and uh, different recommended practices. Uh, code may also, um, according to um, type of building or, or development that may be built, it may be required um, and set at certain intervals uh, around a development. Um, and that also could be part of insurance requir requirements for commercial developments. Um, and it could be based off all, also on uh, if there, there's a uh, fire protection engineer that is contracted to uh, to build a system or a protection system for a specific building or operation or development or something. Um, and that the uh, the developers have to consult the local community codes and standards. All right, the fire flow is a flow rate of water supply measured at, um, at 20 PSI residential, or residual, residential, gotta bear with me. All right, the residual pressure. All right, for an automatic sprinkler system, the water demand and flow rate is based on the sprinkler system design. And uh, we have to make sure that we have adequate water um, supply to, uh, to supply the sprinkler system. Uh, but it also needs to be sufficient for any of the additional fire department equipment, trucks, and and things like that. Um, and then, it, you know, if it's a stand pipe si stand pipe system, uh, it has to be able to uh, maintain the the required flow with um, your um, your hose connections into it to to be able to to put in a a hose line into your kind of larger buildings that may require a standpipe. All right, so you have your static pressure as the, the, the water on the system when water's not moving. When all the valves are closed, uh, what's your, your pressure on the, the pipes? And, um, and that's gonna be your, your pressure that's gonna come down from your, um, your elevated water tank and um, you know, or if the uh, facility may have a fire pump on the system to improve or in, to increase pressure on the system. All right, residual, the residual pressure is the amount of pressure that remains whenever uh, water's opening. All right, so you have your, uh, your static, that's where, kind of going back to the hydrant testing, that's where you put the little cap with the pressure valve on it, and then you open up the hydrant, there's no water moving, but you get your uh, your static pressure. Then your residual is um, where you, you, you put that same cap on one hydrant, you go down to the next hydrant and you flow it. And uh, it kind of gives you the best, or it provides the best in, uh, information that you can have on what your water system is gonna support and uh, you know how much water is going to be available in the system uh, during its normal daily taxing, you know the, the normal demand on the on the system. And then uh, you know if you're flowing uh, for a for a fire flow, and you're you know you're expected to operate other equipment along with your your sprinkler system, and uh, you know kind of what you're you're expecting to look at. And there's different calculations. There is different um, apps and, and books and reference guides and graphs and all kinds of stuff to, uh, to help figure uh, your fire flow. And uh, with all this 
information and data input. All right, and then you have your flow pressure, and that's going to be the, the quantity of water flowing through an opening during a hydric test. And that's where you put the pitot gauge in the, the side of the, the uh, typically your two and a half opening, and you open it up wide open and see you know what your uh, what your pressure is on that. And we have talked about how to test a fire hydrant and discussing uh, what all these are. Uh, that's your static. Uh, that's going to be your your flow. Um, that's going to be your your um, your flow from your your information, and uh, you know we always use the cheat sheet where we can tell by um, the flow from the pitot uh, in the opening about an estimated uh, gallonage and uh, flow that we could expect out of that hydrant, and uh, can use that and log that information in part of our hydrant testing. All right, so uh, getting into the sprinkler systems, most common type of fire suppression system. Um, the sprinkler heads open as each one is heated. Um, I'm sure everybody's aware of it, but you may see in the movies where uh, all the heads just come on all at once, and that just doesn't work like that. Um, but uh, the system consists of underground and overground and above ground and through the ground and all over piping, uh, piping everywhere. Uh, you can see in the uh, the illustration there to the side, we see the water main. Uh, it comes in, up through the piping through a backflow preventer. Um, and that's really important for your fire department connection. If you're pumping in pressure from a truck, that you're not blowing pressure back into your, your water main. Uh, you have a drain valve in case for any type of maintenance on the system. Um, OSMY valve, your alarm, your pressure gauge, uh, above and below the valve, um, your flow uh, switch. It goes into your your uh, riser valve up to the um, um, kind of your distribution pipes that where the sprinkler heads are located and uh, where your your heads are sprinkler heads are mounted. And then uh, there's also the inspector's test valve, um, and that's that's typically um, put where it's easily accessible in the system uh, for the sprinkler system to be uh, tested by a third-party inspector, not a uh, fire inspector. All right, your occupancy hazards, um, just kind of a brief overview. Uh, your light hazard class is where the quantity or the combustibility of materials is kind of low. And um, you know, also your, your ordinary ha hazard class is group one, um, where your combustibility is low and your quantity is moderate. <clears throat> uh, your group two, where the quantity and combustibility are moderate to high. Um, you have your extra hazard occupancy class, again, group one or two, where little or no flammable or combustible liquids, but Significant quantities of highly combustible materials are present. And then your group two of your extra hazard occupancy class, where moderate uh, flammable and combustible liquids are, uh, are present. And then your special occupancy conditions, where high piled combustible stocks, uh, flammable and combustible liquids, combustible dust and fiber, uh, yeah, fibers, large quantities of light uh, or loose combustible materials. Uh, if there's any chemicals or explosives present, it's also going to fall under that special uh, occupancy condition. All right, your water supply, uh, you must have adequate or adequate volume pressure and reliability. All right, so your fire department connection is that uh, the connection through which the fire department can pump water into the system. All right, so if it's kind of a raging fire and it, you're, you're flowing a lot of water, um, you, your your sprinkler heads are already in there. They're already open. They're already activated. <clears throat> so something that's going to make the building safer for anybody that may be um, trapped in those locations, and then also for the firefighters making entry and, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and uh, having to go in and, and to make an attack in those areas, um, we can use the the sprinkler system to our advantage, to where we can Try to keep that fire low or keep it knocked down to where we can put 
uh, some more accurate attacks on the seat of the fire to, to extinguish it completely. Uh, and this is where we're going to do that. We're going to connect in an engine, uh, typically within 50 feet or one hose section uh, into the truck. Uh, you can see that it's uh, two and a half uh, hose connections, and we'll run two, two and a halfs into it from the pump. Uh, and we also want to have a hydrant close by uh, so that we can um, have that flow from a hydrant to be able to pressurize through our truck and put into the system uh, to support and supplement the, uh, the sprinkler system as it operates. Um, we want to make sure with this in mind, uh, this is where we stress the importance of uh, fire apparatus access points so that we can get a fire truck near the sprinkler system or within one hose link um, to the FDC to where we can make a fast connection and, uh, and fast supplement to the system to uh, knock down that fire and keep it, keep it knocked down in a load. All right, so the uh, water distribution pipes, underground water uh, supply main, um, the check valve allows for it to flow in only one direction. The sprinkler system rises, or risers, is connected underground uh, to the supply and uh, connects into the rest of the piping system. Um, the pipe arrangement is, is kind of your, your the uh, schedule system, and it's the traditional plumbing standard, you know, your 20, 40, 80 um, scheduled pipe is your, your wall thickness. Um, and uh, there's going to be a lot of hydraulic calculations that's going to be done uh, in designing and engineering a, a sprinkler system. Um, it's based off of the, uh, the fire flow, your inside diameter of your piping. Um, and, and just like what you would think in, um, in, driver operating or being an operator or an engineer uh, you're, you're calculating in your friction laws your elevation laws your, you know all these different factors that play in uh, to make sure that you have the proper pressure and, and flow at your furthermost uh, sprinkler head and uh, your your main valve options are you know what's present is that you have your alarm valve your drive pipe valve and your release valve Um, you're typically also going to have a water, ter, a water monitor gong. Um, also, it can be a bell, and uh, it's some type of notification device that's powered by the water moving through the system. Um, and it may also be part of your uh, external uh, alarm that uh, whenever you pull up, you may hear it going off, and it's also uh, signaling that there's water flowing. Uh, when the system's activated, the alarm valve opens and the water enters uh, the sprinkler piping um, and it uh, supplies the, the system and um, here's the uh, water main uh, control valves and this is part of your outside stem and, and uh, yoke your OS and Y valve and your post indicator valve um, and that's where if you're connecting to a hydrant system where you can close off <clears throat> your valve to your um, whatever your municipal whatever your water supply is you can close that off and then pressurize up the system to be able to um, to push it in uh, and, and supplement that sprinkler system uh, also you look over at the uh, the post indicator valve and that's going to be the picture all the way to the right has open on it uh, that's the the wrench is um, already connected to it and you can also see that it's, pat or that it's locked on it. And uh, that's to prevent any type of tampering where somebody can't just messing around, shut off the, the water supply to the sprinkler system um, from the outside without cutting off the lock. And that's typically part of fire department operations to cut that off and, and shut the valve if, if need be. Uh, you also have the uh, your uh, wall post indicator valve, um, different butterfly valves that are a part of the system, and uh, they need to be equipped with uh, tamper switches, uh, part of the alarm system, um, or tied into the the fire alarm system. As you can see there, 
has the big wheel and has the, the chain wrapped around it. You know, that's also locked and that prevents somebody from tampering with the system and shutting off the, the fire protection system. Uh, again, bad people want to do bad things. Uh, it takes that, that safety system out of play and they, they may be able to, or may want to go in and start a fire or something like that and try to hurt people. So uh, we want to make sure that they're secured. Now they're locked. Um, so that if there's any maintenance or anything that needs to be done, that it can um, that it can be done without you know, cutting the chain. But um, in the event of a fire, and that's that's always been the policy of everywhere that I've worked. That uh, if you have to to operate one of those valves, you just cut the chain or the lock and um, do what you got to do. All right, you may have a sprinkler system zoning. You know, this is for like large facilities with um large um flow requirements um storage big warehouses stuff like that and uh, the water flow can be shut off to one area and not affect other sprinklers um but uh, typically we're going to have fire pumps to uh, boost the pressure of the system and then some type of static water source on site that's not potable water it's uh it, it's just your static water for fire protection and maybe a pond or something out out that they they have for that uh, purpose all right then you, we talked about the water flow alarms uh, it sounds whenever uh, water begins in the pipe um, and uh, you know we, we talked about this in the last chapter how it activates and let us know that water's flowing in the system <clears throat> The uh, type of sprinkler systems, we have the wet pipe sprinkler system. It's the most common and least expensive. Um, all the pipes are filled with water. It cannot be used where the temperatures uh, drop below freezing. So um, you, know, you may have a building um, up north or something like that where this may not be the, the ideal um, system to have in place, but this is a very common system. Um, in our area because it is least expensive uh, you don't have to have a compressor and uh, and all that to to keep the the water out of the system um, it has, doesn't have to be as regularly inspected and it doesn't take a lot of, of maintenance on it all right here's the uh, dry type sprinkler system now this is where they, they there's a valve where they above it they uh, the pipes are filled with pressurized air or, or nitrogen um, the benefits of the nitrogen um it's going to be more expensive you're typically not going to find it a whole lot uh, but nitrogen moves through different conduits quicker than air and um, so that's why nitrogen is used in some applications um, uh, they're typically for areas that experience below freezing temperatures and uh, it has to be drained back out and, and uh, repressurized with air after every activation. All right, the uh, system may take time to empty and fill with water. Um, the accelerators and uh, exist in opening a clapper valve and moving the air out. Um, and they have exhausters that's allowing air um, in the pipes to to escape out so that the, the water can then flow down the, the pipes and occupy that space. All right, you have your pre-action pre sprinkler systems, and that's a smoke detector or uh, manual pull alarm must be activated before the water is released. And this uses a deluge valve, and uh, it prevents the accidental water discharges. Um, this is something where you're typically gonna see in a big warehouse, um, a chemical plant, something um, where they have to have a lot of water very quickly, but there's also the potential for danger of maybe a forklift hitting a, a sprinkler head or something of that nature to where um, a traditional head may get damaged and may sp put out a lot of water and and cause a significant amount of damage before it's it's contained. Uh, a deluge valve and a deluge system is going to move a lot of water 
Um, so there's a lot of damage that can be incurred by little simple accidents. So that's why you have your pre-action system where it takes an action to activate it. And uh, you have your combined dry pipe and pre-action um, where the pipe contains air under pressure and then the uh, supplementary heat detecting device opens the water control valve or air exhauster. Um, not a major type of sprinkler system. Um, I'm not really familiar with them. Um, just they're, they're not very common. And then your uh, Duluth sprinkler systems, kind of what I was talking about, uh, is typically your dry systems um, operates from the valve, like what we had talked about. But water flows from all the sprinkler heads. That's where you need a lot of water. You need it now. Um, and, and that's going to be the exception to uh, the sprinkler heads all activating at the same time as uh, on a Duluth system. And um, that um, you know, sprinkler head is activated by a manual release. And um, so, right, then you have your dry chem uh, extinguishing systems. They use the powder agents. Um, your, you know, there's a list there: sodium bicarb, potassium bicarb, your aerator-based potassium bicarb, your potassium chloride, ammonium phosphate. Um, and that's going to be for your specific operation. Um, yeah, you know, it looks like to be some type of uh, fueling station or something like that. Um, having some uh, protection system in place. And you have your wet chem extinguishing systems. Um, uses a proprietary liquid and it's not compatible with dry chem agents. Uh, clean agent. Um, Extinguishing systems, uh, they're they're non-conductive and leave no residue. And that's uh, your um, where you, you hear of the halon systems. It, it was big agent of choice. Um, there's there's things that have replaced that, and uh, you know technology has improved. And but uh, you may see this type of system in like a server room or something like that. Um, the carbon dioxide extinguishing system displaces the oxygen in the room. Uh, the, the problem is there's danger of asphyxiation. So that typically comes with some type of auditory and visual um, alarm activation as well. And people, they just get out. There's there's no um, stop waiting and, and uh, take your time. It's uh, really get out because the oxygen is leaving the area. All right, so we're talking about the automatic sprinkler heads. And uh, this is what makes the fire, uh, the sprinkler system work. Um, it activates the, the, um, the system in the area of the fire to, to apply water to the fire. Uh, not to Granny sleeping in, in her room on the other side of the building, um, but to activate the head at the, the point of uh, where the fire is at. All right, they are, they're positioned in several different ways or several different types. I mean, they're just, it's hard to list them all. A few examples you may see, and you may see a combination of all of them according to the application um, that's needed for the, the type of building. You have your upright, your pendant, uh, and sidewall sprinklers, and these are, are a few examples of those. Um, and then your different variations, your dry sprinklers, open sprinklers, your corrosion resistance, and your nozzle sprinklers. And, um, you know, it could be the design and the type of material that it's made out of. <clears throat> and uh, over to the far right is an example of the nozzle sprinkler. And uh, it's kind of the older, older design. Um, you have your ornamental sprinklers, your flush sprinklers, and your recess sprinklers. Um, and, you know, you got to have them and a way to sell them to be nice and, and have people more accepting of them is to make them prettier. Um, you may notice in some of the newer construction, maybe in the last 10 years, uh, building is built in the last 10 years, you'll see sprinkler heads that actually have a cover on them. And uh, and you won't see the sprinkler head. It's it's a. Uh, it's typically in a drop ceiling system like the, the photo that you see on the bottom and they'll have a, um, a cover that 
completely covers up the bottom of the sprinkler head, the little fan blade looking part of the, the fin part of the sprinkler. Um, actually kind of fits up in it so it's flush setting you don't see anything but if there is a fire the heat from the fire melts the solder that solders that end cap it drops down and it drops down the um, the fin and then it exposes either the the activation device whether it's a frangible bulb or a fusible link and then the the heat uh, causes that to uh, to rupture, come apart, or whatever it needs to do uh, to be able to start flowing water. Uh, then you have your intermediate level sprinklers um, as your, your larger, bigger flow, and then uh, your residential sprinklers, which are typically smaller, um, that that's work are there to work with the lower pressures for the residential uh, as your uh, 13D type. You have your early suppression fast response sprinkler heads, typically what you're going to see in deluge systems, and then your large drop sprinkler heads, um, and you'll see those in, in a variety of different um, applications. All right, your fusible link uh, uses a metal alloy to link two pieces of metal together to keep the cap in in place, and um, just kind of to breaking it down the anatomy of the sprinkler head. Uh, you see that little flat bar there in the center, and it's straight and flat. That's going to be your part of your fusible link. Uh, the the curved piece that kind of comes out of the middle uh, connects back into the piece is another part of your fusible link assembly. Uh, there's a plug that it's holding into place into a little hole there right in the, the dead center. And as the, the temperature changes, and it's set for different uh, temperature um, it could be 165, 170, 180, uh, according to the application. Um, at that certain temperature, that fusible link is going to, to melt, to, to come apart, and it's going to release that cap, allowing for the water to flow, and it hits that fin, and it's uh, dispersed in, around in the room like it's supposed to be. Um, the, uh, here's in some examples of frangible bulb type sprinkler heads um, and these are uh, like a glass bulb with a, a certain liquid inside that will at a, at a certain temperature they will bust and will um, release that little you can kind of see it in the center it's a more of a shiny copper looking cap uh, but it'll release that plunger and that cap to allow for the uh, um, the water to flow a uh, chemical pellet sprinkler head uses a plunger uh, mechanism, small chemical pellet to hold the cap into place. Um, and again, it's it, but they're all activated by uh, heat. A uh, little thing. Sometimes you may have an activation on it, and uh, these frangible bulbs, you have to be careful around them. And uh, we have a, a nursing home in... Uh, in Popperville that they had a contractor that was coming in doing some type of um, repair to a, a patient room and um, he had done fine done what he needed to do he turned around was moving his ladder picked it up a little too hard or too far hit the sprinkler head broke the frangible bulb and it flooded out that room um, and we, we had to go put a some wedges into it to uh, stop the flow and they had to, to go and get everything um, put back online and it was a it was a mess. <clears throat> All right, standpipe systems uh, and that's a network of inlets, pipes and outlets for fire hoses. Uh, and it provides water for firefighters typically found in uh, your high rise buildings is, is where you're going to see them. Um, but they may be found in other structures as well according to fire load um in those buildings in the uh type of operation and and all that different factors are going to play in um especially with the code so you have your uh, your class one through three now class one is for fire department use only it's uh typically going to have a, a two and a half connection um and you may have a high rise kit where you you reduce it down to an inch and a half uh, whatever your department standard is, but that's what it's for. 
Uh, you have your class two. Now that's for the building occupant use, and that's uh, the example over in the little uh, windowed uh, door. I have a little, it looks like a water extinguisher and um, that little hose. That's some of that single jacket hose that's, um, you know, it's pretty junky. It's, it's, it, it's not uh, as robust as fire hose, but it's, it's there just for occupancy use. Um, if there's a fire, they can pull it out, turn the valve and, and uh, spray some water. And then you have your class three that, that, uh, that has, features for department use and occupant use. Um, and then they'll have both uh, both fixtures and, and features on them. Um, you have um, your standpipe systems. They're going to deliver a minimum amount of water at a particular pressure uh, to each floor. And um, you have a pressure reducing valve that is often installed. And that's so that you know, you're the guys on the top floor is getting the pressure that they require to operate a nozzle, but the guys on the first floor is not getting killed by overpressurization, um, and it's not you know kicking their butt. Um, all right, so your water supply is uh, you know your wet standpipe systems are connected into water uh, public water supply systems. They may be into a private uh, system like a private. Uh, a static source with a uh, fire pump uh, according to what the application is and what they need. Your dry systems uh, do not usually have a permanent connection to a water supply. Um, and uh, that's something uh, like what I was saying on the private side that uh, you may see the uh, for the dry standpipe as well. All right, your underground flush test is flushed out any foreign material uh, until the water's clean. Um, and it's part of the acceptance testing on that. Uh, hydrostatic testing makes sure that us that the system components uh, are not going to leak, and uh, they'll pressurize them up and and keep them pressurized a certain certain range for a certain amount of time, and uh, they typically do that. Um, to, to make sure that they're, they're not going to have any uh, water damage and, and leaking above the ceilings and all that. Uh, your air test and a dry pipe system, make sure the pipe uh, piping will hold the pressure uh, where you find any issues and where they weld the pipe together and, and uh, making sure that everything's nice and tight and proper. Um, the main drain test, it uh, It'll let you know whether the water supply is compromised. Um, and the uh, hood and duct system testing, uh, it's going to ensure the proper nozzles are at the proper locations. Um, and that's going to be for like hood systems, um, commercial kitchen. And, um, you know, there's the example of that can be like the balloon testing where they, they have little nozzle heads and uh, they'll just charge them with uh, the propellant. And uh, they put balloons up, and you know, typically they put a certain size balloon, and within a certain amount of time, it should pop the balloon uh, with the amount of pressure. And, and uh... all right, documentation of each test is crucial. And uh, if there's any deficiencies, uh, it needs to be checked and tested again until it meets a compliancy. Um, and you know, copies need to be you know, as part of your documentation, especially on your acceptance testing, um, where you know, everybody needs a copy of it. All right, so our uh, summary real quick is your fire suppression system includes your sprinkler system, stands pipe system, any specialized extinguishing system um, before doing any work. Um, you know, the, the sprinkler contractor must submit the documents for review. Um, know that the uh, the basic types of water supply and distribution system, uh, public and private. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to point out, I didn't at the beginning because I was thinking that we're going to talk more on the private water systems and uh, how to the differentiation between the two. Um, and, and for the guys that are municipal guys, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. But if you volunteer with a a smaller department or, or kind of out more of a rural area. It's something to, to keep in mind. Um, another thing about the private 
water companies. And uh, in our area, we have several private water companies that uh, that they have their own board and all that. But um, you, what differentiates um, between public and private a lot of times is their mission. And you look at the mission statement of, of your public water systems, and they're typically going to be um, – Uh, they're, they're typically going to be, their mission is to provide potable water, but also fire protection. Um, and that's where you're, you're able to get the development and all that that you need. On a private water system, their, their mission is to provide potable water. And uh, we've had a couple of our private uh, associations in our area that have went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the fire departments to say, our job is not to provide fire protection water. Um, our job is to provide potable drinking water uh, to these residents. So you may have a, a, a little battle there um, as you're inspecting these different places. Kind of know the the area, know the system that you're that you're dealing with, and uh, you know that that may be something to keep in mind whenever you're reviewing these plans um, and you're you're making these decisions is, um, you know, what the mission of, of that water group um, and association is going to be, and is it going to be adequate for the system in place? And, uh, you know, is it to where a, you say you may have a developer that wants to develop in a, in a rural part of your, your area where the water system's not that great? Um, you know, how far are you going to go and get variances um, for their fire flow? Are you going to require stuff like a static water source and, and fire pump and things like that? So there's a lot of different things to be aware of and to, to keep in mind uh, to be, you know, an effective inspector is, is really knowing your area and all the different all the different features that, that affect um, your, your job and, and the decisions that you make. All right. Uh, continuing on with the summary. Uh, we know the, the two different types of hydrants, uh, the dry barrel and wet barrel, and uh, you know that they're located according to local standard and, and code. Um, your fire fire flow rate of a water uh, supply is typically measured at, at uh, 20 psi residual pressure um, for firefighting, and uh, you know that may be something that you keep in the mind in a certain area where. Um, for certain develops and certain developments may require and to improve static water sources on the scene, which may be um, changing the operation or supplementing operation with like a, a tanker or a water tender. Uh, so that's something again to keep in mind. And your water supply uh, must be sufficient for the, the sprinkler system, uh, plus the additional inf uh, equipment on um, on the fire scene, your apparatus and and all the things that, that you may need, uh, that's, that's, I know for us, it's always a concern of having adequate water supply for deck guns and ladders and, and stuff like that to be able to, to have that elevated water stream and, uh, and making sure that a system's going to support it. Um, uh, something else to talk about that um, is, you know, if your system, if your water system has a redundant backup, um, an area where I worked, they they were actually tied into a, a neighboring water association, and if for some reason the the fire flow um, was expected to drop because of the size of the fire, they had the ability to open up a valve and to supply supplemental pressure and uh, and flow from another system or another water tower uh, to be able to supplement it. And uh, that's something good to know that you have that that backup there. And uh, the uh, sprinkler system's job is to uh, to di discharge the water in a sufficient uh, density to control or extinguish a fire in, in the incipient stage. Um, you know, during that design, we, we have to think about the, the different hazards um, in the occupancy and in the water supply. And that, that's something we really kind of harped on on that. Um, but... Yeah, you know, the main the main job is to keep the fire low, even if it doesn't extinguish it in the, the incipient stage. 
it's it's to buy our our occupants more time to be able to uh, to escape. Um, that's why you see in your convalescent care and hospitals and stuff like that being able to um, having plans in place to to evacuate non-ambulatory patients and, and things of that nature um, in those type of situations. You know that's that's the job of the sprinkler system, um, whether it be commercial or residential dwelling, um, is to buy that that extra time. Um, uh, we need to know that the major types of the uh, automatic sprinkler system include the wet pipe, dry pipe, and pre-action deluge system. Um, be be familiar with with all those because you're you're going to deal with that a lot as an inspector. Uh, sprinkler heads are the the working end of the <coughs> excuse me of the uh, sprinkler system. Generally, they're going to serve the, uh, the functions of activating this, the uh, system and applying the water to the fire. Uh, we also want to make sure that they're they're taken care of. Um, they are they do need to be properly maintained. <clears throat> they need to be cleaned around. Uh, if there's something you notice, and, and especially for some reason, fusible links attract all kinds of dust and grime and gunk and all that, and they need to be properly maintained. And, and uh, uh, if you think of it, if that fusible link is set to go it and uh, to melt and to activate that sprinkler system at 165 degrees and it's got all kinds of gunk and um, um, dust and, and things like that on it then it's essentially making an insulation and it's insulating it from the the temperature and it's it's prolonging its activation so uh, you making sure that they're clean is is a really important part of the inspection process as well and uh, you know, they can be cleaned pretty easily with without risk of accidental activation by like a duster or something like that. Um, also making sure that in places um, that they don't paint over them um, because that can inhibit their operation. Um, uh, they can make it where they don't they don't spray. Uh, they don't deliver a water uh, pattern properly. Um, uh, you definitely don't want any any type of uh, paint on the either fusible link or the frangible bulb for that same factor of, of causing an insulation uh, issue there and, and uh, causing a delay in its activation. <clears throat> All right, in a standpipe system, we know that it's a network of inlet pipes and outlets for fire hoses that are building the structure and uh, it can be uh, to provide water for firefighting purposes. Um, either from the occupants from civilian use or um, fire department use or both and uh, we have to know that the fire inspector does not conduct the test of the sprinkler system but observes the test and records its results uh, as part of the documentation documentation process in, in these especially new construction acceptance tests and stuff like that test stages include the underground flush test hydrostatic test air test uh, in a dry pipe system if needed in a main drain test um, and uh, you know also checking the different valves uh, and the um, pressure gauges and things like that and that's something that we'll we'll talk about um, in our our field trip all right so uh, any questions um, any questions on sprinkler systems and anything like that No, sir. Everybody's brain's already sizzling. It's not too bad. Um, it's a lot of information to know. It's very, very particular. But this is, man, these the sprinkler systems, that's, that's our front line um, in, in a lot of these buildings and a lot of the higher risk, uh, higher hazard, you know, multiple occupancy, residential um, or multiple occupant residential buildings and stuff like that is, you know, we, the, the sprinkler system saves lives, and that's that's what it's there to do. Um, and that that's I guess that's why I harp more on sprinkler systems uh, during my inspections and, and in this class is because they're there for a very important reason. And uh, if they function properly, they can save a lot of lives. Uh, if they're not maintained, um, they can be the reason why a lot of people lose their lives. So. Um, 
So anyway, any more questions?